Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are excited to see you all here today as we talk about performance-based hiring with Lou Adler. Um, bear with us for a couple of minutes. We're going to allow some time for people to join. We are right on the hour, but we will be getting started any minute now. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Lou. Look forward to being here with you, Ed. I'm going to turn off my phone here so I'm not disturbed. Well, I'm disturbed anyway, but I won't be disturbed by that anyway. Not more disturbed. <laughs> Hey, as people begin, let me kind of just do this chat because I want to make sure the chat works. Uh, please put in what you would consider your most significant hiring challenge in the chat area. Part of this is to get everybody warmed up here, but also we might actually address some of those. I know we have a number of people monitoring the chat, so we'll be able to take a look at it. Good, we got one in here. Dude, this Hi, is my hiring favorite. technical talent, okay. <laughs> This is my favorite kind of webinar. You're uh, you're all on mute, um, so me and Lou get to steal the spotlight for uh, for the next forty five minutes or so. But we do we have plenty of people standing by to help with the chat, and we are paying attention. Yeah, interesting budgeting approval for higher wages, changing hiring manage uh, Jasmine changing hiring manager mentality. I've been working on that since before you were born, before your parents were born even. But we'll show you some ideas for today. Getting hiring manager buy-in. Yeah, that to me is a, what do you think, Ed? We're ready to kind of rock and roll here or what do you want to do? I'll give it like, a, give it another 30 seconds. Um, I see the, the attendee count oh. is, is still climbing. Um, we will get started very, very shortly. We've got a, a big session planned today. We're super excited to be here. Um, glad that everybody could make it. I'm sure you're all coming in from different time zones and different places. We are yeah. just going to give it another 30 seconds or so, and then we're going to make a start. Yeah, I'm reading a lot of these um, comments. Some of them are, well, they're all relevant. Some of them are topical given the current set of circumstances, and some of them are uh, existing since time immemorial. Um, getting hiring managers more engaged, uh, being able to have hiring managers see a different marketplace. And I think we're gonna address a lot of those. So interesting how even a veteran fail SEO search, those are all important issues. And all have some fundamental themes of, I think we'll, we can give you some ideas on how to address them today. Yeah, we have some we have some interesting um, functionality to talk about in regards to ATS search too. So, uh, so Justin, we might be able to solve a problem for you or two as we go along today. All right, I think that we can officially make a start. Um, welcome everybody. We are delighted to have you here. Uh, my name is Ed Padini. I'm the head of customer success here at Seekout, um, and I am thrilled to have the uh, award-winning author um, and very influential recruiter, sourcer, and trainer, Lou Adler here. Um, and he's gonna be telling us all about performance-based hiring. Um, we're gonna take the opportunity to talk a little bit about how Lou's fantastic framework um, can be uh, implemented and augmented through the use of SeekOut as well. Um, to be action-packed, we have a lot of practical tips and advice as we go through. Um, and if you hang around all the way until the end, we are gonna tell you how you can get your very own free copy of Hire With Your Head, Lou's um, newest uh, revision. Um, of his award-winning book, and we're very excited to be giving that away today. Yeah, sounds like it uh, should be an interesting day. Ed, am I part of this? No, I'm, I tend to be <laughs> a bit of a wiseacre, so that hasn't changed at all. So, Lou, do you want to maybe give a, a brief introduction uh, of yourself for people who don't yeah, know sure. you? Yeah, sure. No, I think work? it's, uh, as I read these comments, I've been a recruiter for since literally since 1978 pretty old guy, but I didn't start as a recruiter. My background is in manufacturing operations, finance and accounting and uh, engineering and a lot of different kinds of things. But so I see some fundamental issues that have always existed uh, and some new ones that are kind of overlay it. So I think my background is a little bit unique. Even when I first became a recruiter, I never used job descriptions, but having some subject matter expertise allowed me uh, to have a little different credibility. And we'll get into some of those stories today as we uh, tie seek out uh, into performance-based hiring. And let me just make, uh, as part of Hire With Your Head, and I don't think Ed knows this, I literally looked at 50 to 75 different technologies. 
I came down to 10 that I thought were very, very important. CCAT was one of the top three, and it becomes number one when it's combined with performance-based hiring because it's high technology meets high touch. And I think that's really the theme of what I want to talk about today or what we want to talk about today. And I, that will evolve as we go forward. That is fantastic. Um, and we are definitely looking forward to it. Um, there's there's going to be, a, I think, a couple of really great outcomes for people who are, are here on the call and listening to this today. Um, you know, Lou is going to be talking about his, um, his performance-based hiring strategy and, and talking about how we can identify top performers for any role. Um, the concept of semi-finalists, I, I think, is, is super interesting. And my recruiting background is not quite as strong as Lou's, but um, I've also been doing this for a long time before joining Seek Out. And, and I think he really has a, a fantastic formula here for, for how to win the passive source game. So I'm, I'm excited to be part of showing this off with him today. Um, attracting qualified candidates, super important. I'm not going to help anybody if we can find some great people, if no one will talk to you. Um, and Lou's going to be talking about how to write really engaging content. I'm going to show you how to automate that content using Seekout. Um, and of course, we're going to show you how Seekout's search and um, functionality really helps you find these top performers, find these semi-finalists, do it in a very efficient and effective way, um, really save you some time and and get some people into that recruiting pipeline as quickly as possible. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, SeekOut is essentially an AI-powered talent search engine. Um, what we're doing is we're aggregating data from about 37 different social and professional networks. Uh, LinkedIn profiles are the backbone, but we've got GitHub and Stack Overflow. Um, we have social networks like Reddit and Instagram and Facebook, um, but we're also pulling in data from an enormous database of patents, papers, publications, uh, journals, conference presentations, all sorts of things that go together. We create a unified profile. Um, we were, means that you're not just searching for prospects based on what they say about themselves, um, but you're also able to search based on what people have actually done, um, as well as the things that we can infer about them um, by putting all of that information together. Um, we have fantastic data visualization tools, really great AI for, for matching and cloning, um, really the industry's leading diversity sourcing functionality. And we are the number one diversity sourcing tool for enterprise. Um, and we'll be really excited to talk a little bit about how that works too. Um, and of course, big value add for Seekout is that we take you off of LinkedIn. You don't have to rely on in-mails. We have contact details, including phone numbers, as well as email addresses for the prospects that you find. Um, and you can take that fantastic content that Lou's going to be talking about. You can get it in front of the right person at the right time without getting stuck behind somebody's spam filter, have more conversations and really be successful in your hiring. And we're not gonna, not gonna show too much about how that all works today. There's an opportunity to come back and look at it in more detail, but we'll give you a sneak peek of how that applies to performance-based hiring, which is probably a good segue um, to turn it over to Lou to talk about performance-based hiring. Yeah, I'd say, um, and here's really the issue. And I, I'm just gonna address some of the questions that people have already uh, raised. When I started as a recruiter in 19, literally 1978, and I had 10 years of business background prior to that. I, the only reason I even became a recruiter was uh, I, I quit my job as a general manager of a manufacturing company and felt, hey, I think I could become a good recruiter, whether I, it took a long time to become one. But my first assignment, I absolutely did not use a job description. It was a manufacturing company, president of the company said he wanted someone uh, with 10 years of experience and five years of this and background here. And I said, no, that's not a job description. That's a person description. What do you want the person to do? Uh, and he said, I want someone to turn around the plant. I said, fine, let's walk through the plant. Uh, so we walked through the plant and in 45 minutes or an hour, we found six or seven big things that had to happen. Uh, and I found someone three weeks later who could do that work. And I've never used a skills-based job description since that time. I always ask the hiring manager, what does this person need to do to be successful? This morning, I'm with a group, a board of directors of a company in the Midwest, uh, hiring someone to do corn milling, and they want to improve it. And they had a whole list of things, what they needed for this general manager. And I don't do recruiting anymore, but I help companies find people. I just, what do you want the person to do? And it was turn around a corn milling plant, which I have no idea what a corn milling plant even looks like. But, and the, then the uh, board chairman of the board says, Lou, you really know corn milling, don't you? No, I know work. And I think that became win-win hiring. Hiring for the anniversary date, not the start date. And all the problems we have with hiring managers opening uh, 
the talent pool, diversity, as far as I'm concerned, are caused by using job descriptions that list skills, experience, and competencies. That is not a job description. That is a person description. If you define the work the person needs to do and don't compromise on it, you'll you have some success. What we're going to do today is take you through a tour of how do we find semifinalists? People can do that work and be motivated to do that work and would see the jobs move. But we start by defining success. So it's this combination of high tech and high touch and hiring for the anniversary date means a year from now. Now for this general manager spot, it was two years, but at the end of the period of time, a year or two, the candidate says, I'm so glad I took this job and I'm glad I'm here. And the hiring manager says, I'm glad I hired that person. That is different than hiring for the start date. And fundamentally, that's the key. Define success as performance objectives, look long-term, not short-term, make the decision of from a win-win hiring perspective, hire for the anniversary date, not the start date. So we'll kind of walk you through that, but that's really the highlight of it. I, I'm with you on that, Lou, 100%. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of people fall into the trap um, of, of thinking that job descriptions are a big list of requirements um, and, and very much forget it's all about what success actually looks like. Um, but more importantly than that, it's, it's about how do you articulate to somebody why they should come and work with you versus the 10,000 other choices that they potentially have. And I think you've got a really good framework for answering both of those questions here. Well, I think part of it, Ed, is, and I think this is real important, is we have two buyers here. Buyer one is the hiring manager and the hiring team. Buyer two is a candidate and his or her family. Uh, unless there's someone's desperate for a job, they don't just make it uh, based on some idle criteria. But we as recruiters say, oh, we want someone to start tomorrow and this has got to be the criteria and here's the comp. But no, if you look at it as two decision makers who are discriminating, the whole dynamics of how you find and hire people changes. And as every recruiter knows, both of those buyers can say no. It is a tough sales job. Yep. I am going to step us forward, um, which I'm assuming is the right thing to do. But you, you let me know, Lou, if I'm uh, yeah. If I'm why, controlling I can build this the whole the, uh, slide up, and I'll kind of do you it. Let me go. I mean, okay. Everybody in the world wants to hire a great person. Everybody. And they're, they're all different, but every, oh, I want to hire a great person, great account, great engineer, great sales rep, great manager. And I just say, if you want to hire a great person, you got to give them a great job. If you want to hire an average person, give them an average job. If you want to hire a, a, a below average person, give them a below average job. But if your job isn't a great job, uh, success is problematic. So this is where I said, when I take an assignment, and I've literally taken uh, probably three to 4,000 assignments where I ask the hiring manager and the hiring team, what does this person need to do to be successful? And every single job in the world can be defined by five or six key performance objectives. Build a team of accountants, launch a new product line in six months, upgrade the interface to do A, B, and C. It, I always define work as a series of key performance objectives, alternatively OKRs, objectives, and key results. I then look for semifinalists, and we're going to show you how we can do that within Seekout. Uh, within Seekout. A semifinalist meets three criteria. Number one, they can do that work. If they can't do the work, forget it. Number two, they've been recognized for doing that work, which indicates they're in the top half, top third, top quartile. So not only they can do that work, they're also good at it. I know that if they meet that two, those two conditions, the hiring manager would absolutely talk to the person on the phone. Great person. Why would you not talk to the person? And number two, though, the other third criteria for a semifinalist, they have to see the job as a clear career move, not a lateral transfer. With what we're going to show you within Seekout, I only need 15 to 20 people at most. I call them semifinalists. I have to talk to 50 to 60% of them uh, to get them and engage with them, but I don't need more than uh, 15 to 20 people at most at the top of the funnel. What I have to do is be persistent. Too many people I call, they use the email and pray process. Oh, let's, let's find more candidates, meet all the filters, let's send emails out and find someone who is interested in our job. I, no, I, I'm, I'm pre-qualifying the people I'm going after and I'm gonna convince them this job's a career move. That's called recruiting. Uh, and that's really the key. And that's why I love Seekout because I can get these semifinalists in a couple of hours. I then have to interview them. And this morning when I was talking to the board, the chairman said, well, how do you interview candidates? And in this case, I, I just told them, we're gonna, I'm going to give you a highlight on how to do it. I just dig deep into their accomplishments related to the job. But as part of recruiting them, I've got to show that not only have I done my due diligence on assessing this person, they have to see this job as a career move. So part of what I'm also looking at is what they don't have in their background that my job offers. And that's what I use to close the deal. I never have enough money in a budget. Everyone's complaining about the budget. I've never, I've, I've, 
I have for 40 years, I've never had enough money in a budget, but I've closed a lot of deals because I give them the best career move amongst competing alternatives. And then during the onboarding process, I clarify what's been discussed at the intake meeting. And then I got to deliver on the promise. And that's what we call win-win hiring. And that's really the beauty is that this is a high touch process, but Seekout can give me all the names instantly. And that's why I, when I first saw Seekout, I guess I met Ed, well, I met the, the team at Seekout a couple of years ago. But when Ed walks me through this thing, I start salivating. I almost wish I was a recruiter. There's no question. If I had this today and I was 30, 40 years younger, I'd be the number one recruiter in the world. There's just no question in my mind. It is just a, such a powerful tool. But rather than me salivating here, let you go take on, Ed. Well, you could you'd always come back and, uh, and, and join our recruiting right. team. I know. That's my retirement program. Office stands. Um, we have a we have a pretty fantastic case study uh, that we're going to take you through today that, that Lou and I have been able to develop. Um, we've we've picked a, a pretty generic role, something that I think a lot of people would be familiar with. We're, we're looking for a national account manager in this case, and we're not we're not going to say where it comes from, but uh, we have taken this from a, a real organization. Um, this is a SaaS security company. Um, they specifically target enterprise customers. They're doing deals in the 100 to 250K range. And they've got a mid-length sales cycle for this kind of work, sort of six to nine months. So there's there's quite a lot involved in sort of pushing the deal forward and actually being able to get things done. It's not a very transactional sale that's happening here. Um, but I think what's really important, you know I mean? outside the nuts and the bolts is understanding these key performance objectives from the case study, what Lou was just talking about in terms of not, not a list of keyword or skill requirement, but what the success actually look like for whoever comes into this role and how can we talk about that to prospective candidates. Um, so we've got a major objective here, um, which is they need to achieve a run rate of 250K per quarter within their first six months um, and 500K a quarter within the first 18 months. That's a great major objective because it is simple, it's measurable, it's understandable, we can talk to people about it, um, and we can talk about why that is actually achievable. Um, when we sort of break that down a little bit further, I'm not going to read all of these out to you, um, but we talk about the territory and the plan and working with others, and, and we have some real data um, around, you know, what prospecting looks like and what conversion rates look like. We're coming into this from an informed standpoint, so we are going to sound like we know what we're talking about when we talk to candidates who know how to do this kind of work, um, and we can relate their past experience um, and whether they've done this level of activity and success back to the organization to demonstrate that we've got somebody who's going to be a good fit here. Okay, so let me, kind of, this, let me oh, add a little ad lib yep. to this, Ed. So when I took this assignment, mm -hmm. I talked to the hiring manager and it, the typical job description didn't look like this. I mean, it, it literally said 10 years of experience, uh, major accounts, I had a list of them, had this kind of industry, this kind of background. I called the hiring manager up and said, no, that's not a job description. That's a person description. What does the person need to do where everybody on the team agrees that this person's successful in six to 18 months? And this is what he came up with. He said, oh, they got to make their numbers. Okay, what are their numbers? And what would they do first? Well, they're going to learn a product line. So why don't they put a feature uh, competitive analysis together of their products versus the compet competition? That makes good sense. Build a territory plan. Who helps them with the territory plan? The SDRs and the customer success people. How many visits do they need to make? How many do they need to close? So it's, I just had the hiring manager walk me through the process of success. There's a point in that which is very, very critical, is I'm now telling the hiring manager how he or she has to assess the candidate. I so just dig deep and ask the candidate to give you some major accomplishments to see if they follow this process. So all of a sudden, I'm taking the candidates or the hiring manager's typical interviewing methodology and saying, no, no, you're going to dig deep into this person's background and follow this path of success. So I, I purposefully define the process of success with the hiring manager so that that person will, and I don't even have to train that person to interview, it's logical they would do this. So I get the hiring manager to own uh, this process, just like I did this morning with this uh, corn milling plant. They want to hire a new general manager. I'm talking to the whole board, walk me through this. Now, I didn't know that, but if I even knew that job, I want the hiring manager to own the process of success because then they naturally interview candidates that way. So I just wanted to kind of highlight the importance of building a performance-based job description this way. 
No, I, absolutely. I, mean, I think I think apart from being a better framework to assess people that you're interviewing, um, I think these kind of interviews actually have a much better candidate experience, especially when you're talking with senior candidates. Um, you know, you're, you're sort of rolling out that red carpet. You're doing an interview process um, that is focused on success as opposed to ticking a number of boxes. And, and you're starting the process of closing that candidate right at those first discussions by doing that. So I think there's lots of advantages sort of about thinking about it this way. You bet. Um, so, Lou, you know, we've we've got our case study, we've got our job description, we've we've pulled it out into into your version these these key performance objectives. But um, I mean, that's only the first step. I mean, I think taking it one step further and really thinking about how you search and how you find people that might look like this is is very very important. And that's what sort of gets us into that finding a semi finalist side of things. Tell us a little bit more about super skills and achiever terms and how this all comes together. Okay, so again. As a recruiter, I know I'm a good recruiter. So, I mean, you got to be able to get, and that, that's probably why I think the high tech is, hey, this is actually a pretty cool tool because you can talk to people. Um, but what I don't need a lot of candidates. I just need semi-finalists. These people who can do the work, who've been recognized for doing the work and would see the jobs or career move. So I only need what I call super skills. If they've got, and so I'm, in any job is four or five. I mean, for an accountant, uh, it could be some advanced technical background. For an engineer, it could be some kind of design capability or tool. Uh, so I said, if they have one of those super skills, like all the ones that are below that, uh, somebody called them power filters. I don't know if I call them that. I call them, hey, they're super skills. This person has to sell enterprise software, cloud-based, SaaS-based security software, probably one or two other super skills. But if they have that, they're in a the game. I don't care if they have a hundred skills. I got those three or four or five, they're in the game. But now I've also got what I call achiever terms. And every single job has an achiever term. Sales is the easiest because have they got rookie of the year, they got quota, they put the word 100%. Sales rep doesn't even put the word 100% unless they made their quota, uh, they hide it. Uh, so I'm looking for things that a sales national accounts manager would have uh, and also being rapidly promoted. If I'm looking for a technical person, it could be uh, rapid promotion, assign bigger projects, could be a patent, could be a speaker, could be a mentor. I mean, there's words that every single job have that would put them in the top half, top third, top quartile. Again, if they meet criteria one and two, I know the hiring manager would talk to the person. Now I have to, so I can identify 15 or 20 people that way, but I also now to pre-qualify them is, what's the likelihood this person will call me back? Because seek out, I can they got every, I can find they're only passive candidates. I don't I need I don't care whether they're active or passive. I care if they're good. But if they're uh, but since candidates are getting hundreds of offers, I got to be a little bit more creative. I have to give them what, what would be logical that I could give this person a career move with just a few words that say, hey, let's just talk about this. This could be a career move. Could be a better title, could be a slower company going to a faster company, a big company to a small company, more attractive product line. I know in sales, uh, if I can have a long, a three to four year product life cycle, that's that's an indicator I can get someone. I already want to in the sales, here's the challenge. I already want someone who's making their numbers. So I got to talk to them and show them, hey, you come with me, you might get a hit on your numbers, but over a two to three year period, the numbers are going to be better. So you got to understand your buyer, which in this case, the candidate I don't need is the candidate. I don't need uh, below average salespeople and hopefully I get one that sticks. No, I want above average salespeople. And I don't care if it's a sales rep, an engineer, a, manu uh, a marketing and accounting person. I'm always looking for people who are already good at what they do. In sales, I got to put them on a faster track record with more money. So that's what the de deal is. So this is how I find semi-finalists. Can do the work, top performer, and would see the job as a career move. I, can you find me some? Can you find I, us some candidates for this job? I, I, well, that's a great segue. Let's try it. Um, I, I think there's a lot of great content there, but one of the things that you passed over that I particularly love um, is saying that you don't care whether or not people are actually open to an opportunity or not. Um, I talk to so many recruiters who just live in that open to opportunity section um, and, and are missing out on, on everybody else. And, and my feeling, and I think your feeling too, is everybody is open to an opportunity. You just have to have the right one. Um, and if you can find the right opportunity for the right person and, and you can get that message across in the right okay, so way, it, they're going to have that conversation with okay, you. Stop there for a second. I want everyone to chat in this area. Here's a question we came up with when I first became a recruiter is I call it the universal yes question when I get someone on the phone. 
what percent of the people would answer yes to this question? So just put this in chat. This is an interactive test. So here's my universal yes question. Would you be open to explore a situation if it were clearly superior to what you're doing today? So just in what percent of the people do, and we actually know, <laughs> it's, well, it's close to 93. We actually did this with 20,000 people on LinkedIn. It's close to 93%. Um, why would they not? Um, exactly. so, I mean, so this is the idea. We want to engage people in conversations. I don't sell the job. I sell the conversation. So now as we look for people, I want you to understand I'm going for win-win hiring. Let's just have a conversation. If it's not a great job, fine, we'll network. But if it's a great job, let's get serious. So I think that's really the mindset. It's a different approach. I'm not looking for people who are looking. I'm looking for people who will discuss, have a conversation with me. So Ed, I'm sorry, I kind of no, no, say this awkward. hour seminar could leave three hours. I, so I, I, I could not agree more. I mean, that's that, that 100% the key um, to having a successful sales call with, with a candidate. You are absolutely on the money. Um, so I want to want to take a little segue here. Um, let's go a little bit interactive. Um, I am going to hop over into Seek Out. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, and we're going to take a look at how this actually works in practice. Um, I have built up a number of different searches um, following lose um, achiever terms and, and success criteria. Um, and I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you what that looks like in Seek Out. Like all good software demos, I've got one that I've prepared earlier. Um, so we're going to step through and we're going to look at it as opposed to going through all of the details of building up the searches. But I'll explain what I've done. Um, and I'm going to uh, jump backwards and forwards a little bit and, and I'll show you some other tips and tricks that might be really interesting for you as we go along. So this is Seek Out. Um, we are looking at our 642 million candidates that are being aggregated from those 37 and, uh, social and professional networks. And, and here is an example of one of those unified profiles that I've been talking about. We're taking all of these things that we know and we put it together into one standardized view um, so that you don't have the unconscious bias of looking at things like people's resumes and different formatting, um, but also so that you're seeing what people say about themselves, you're seeing the things that they've actually done, um, and you're seeing what our systems are able to infer about these candidates. Um, and this particular example, you can see that the skills and the education is summarized here. Um, this person is an engineer, they have a GitHub account. We've pulled that in so you can see what kind of code they write, what languages they know, and we can dig deeper into this. And we give you analytics about how good it is and how popular they are on GitHub and all of those things. But this person also comes back as an expert. They are published. They have papers where they are, for example, in 2017, um, have published in the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, and we are indexing all of this. So if I was looking for an engineer that was interested in astronomy, because maybe I am doing that kind of work, um, we would be able to bring this person back and say, hey, here is somebody that meets all of those requirements. And you would never have known these things if you'd only seen them on LinkedIn. Um, we also have inferences about the kinds of technologies they know. Um, we've been able to use our machine learning systems to understand that based on the skills and experience and publications and GitHub and Stack Overflow data that we found, this is somebody who knows data science. This is somebody who knows machine learning. This is somebody who knows backend engineering. And these are not keyword matches. So if I was looking for these things, I would find them without having to search for specific keywords or methodologies. So how do we take all this and how do we actually find a semi-finalist for our national account manager? role. Um, to begin with, um, we are going to take some of those required skills. We were looking for somebody who has SaaS, somebody who's in the enterprise space, and somebody who is in the cybersecurity space. And I, I know a little bit more about those skills, um, so I've dug into those a little bit. But it's a very simple keyword search. I'm, I'm starting quite broadly here. Um, and we've narrowed down our pool. We have 365,000 candidates, which is a lot. We are not going to talk to them all, but we are starting down the path of what we're looking for. Um, I need to get that a little bit more focused. Um, so in this particular search, I've restricted us to just the United States, um, but I've also done something very special, something only SeekOut can do, which is I've, I've applied the leading security company's power filter. Um, we have done the hard work for you. We have built hundreds and hundreds of searches that can be overlaid across your um, searches that you're running. And in this case, um, we have compiled a list of all of the top security companies, um, the companies who do security, the companies who are good at security. Um, and just by applying that, now we're looking at 3.4 thousand candidates that are actually in the right industry as well as having those skills. 
Still not a short list, but we can take it a little step further. Um, again, in this case, it's a pretty naive way of doing it, but we just want to show some examples. We started adding some more of those criteria. Now we have those achiever terms, people who are talking about exceeding their quota or being rookie of the year or hitting the president's club. And we've overlaid a title search. So we're looking for people who are account managers at the moment, and we've brought ourselves down to just 90. Um, and as we go through this, and as, as we look at these profiles, we see that we're looking at people who are a very, very high fit um, for, for the success criteria that Lou has been describing, but we can take it even further still and save ourselves some time. One of the fantastic things that we can do with Seekout um, is we're able to build Boolean searches that prefer certain terms. Um, and in this particular case, I'm preferring the term rookie of the year. So I've got those same 90, but I've lifted all of the rookies of the year to the top search results. Um, and Michelle here, who pops up as the second result, if I pop open her profile on LinkedIn, um, we can actually actually see that she doesn't just match all that criteria that we're looking for, but if we look at how she talks about herself, talks about her time at Oracle, um, here she is in Oracle's Club Excellence Program, here she is at overachieving her quotas year on year on year. Um, and I think, you know, Lou, if you're looking for somebody who is, is going to be that up and comer, is going to be hitting all of those achievers, this is exactly what you want to see in somebody who's in a sales or account management role. So Michelle might be just right for us in terms of what we're actually looking for. There are lots of other ways that we could potentially be refining this and narrowing down people who are a really good fit for us. Um, here I've shown an example of finding people who've been promoted multiple times in their current role. Um, we have some filters that allow you to contrast how long they've been in their role with how long they've been in their company. Um, and these seven people from that list of 90 are ones who have received internal promotions in their current employer. So not only do we have all the skills that we're looking for, not only do we have the experience experience and location that we're looking for. Not only do we have those achiever terms, but we're also seeing people who are being internally promoted and on an upward career trajectory, which is a great indicator that they are going to be successful. Um, if I go back up to sort of my broad category, um, we have really fantastic visualizations. If we're maybe not entirely sure what path we want to go down yet, we can look at all of this graphically in an interactive way and maybe come up with ideas that we didn't currently know. Um, going through this, we might see, for example, that IBM is, is you know, very highly frequented. 1% of that entire talent pool is working at IBM, and that might Right. Flick a little switch saying, hey, you know, we really should talk to some IBMers. They'd be great for this role. I have, I have a pitch as to why XIBM is going to be really good for this particular role in this particular company. And that's all interactive. I can click on that. And now we've gone down to those 4,000 candidates that are working in IBM. We also do that for diversity. So these 4,000 candidates at IBM with that cybersecurity experience, we can see the diversity makeup of that pool. They are 20% female. They are 4.8% Hispanic and 3.8% Black or African American. If I'm doing a diversity focused campaign and I really want to speak to some women who have this particular experience, again, I've just clicked one button, we've gone back. If you remember, we were on 394,000 candidates and with just a couple of clicks, I'm looking at 950. We are three quarters of the way through to finding our semi-finalists. And now not only are we looking at people who have the skills, the achiever terms, the other criteria that we need, but we're looking at people who match a diversity category that's important for my slate and I can get them into that recruiting pipeline. So there's really powerful functionality here. And at the end of the call today, we'll tell you how you can join us and learn more about how this all works or how it might be applicable to your particular use cases. Um, I'm going to jump back into um, our presentation at this point because we want to talk a little bit about what we do when we actually find these shortlisted candidates. Um, and then again, I am gonna show you how we can use Seekout to automate that process and do some really exciting things. So Lou, engaging candidates, tell us about what's next. We've got these semifinalists, what are we gonna do? You know, I think here's the issue is that, I mean, there was a couple of remarkable people there. And as a recruiter, I said, <laughs> those are remarkable people. Uh, one of the things that I always do though, and I, and this, would probably be just before I send out an email. Uh, and you might want to just look at that email and, and make comments is now I've got 15 or 20 and I've, I, and I really spent a lot of time pre-qualifying candidates. But part of that pre-qualifying is I go to the hiring manager and say, hey, if this woman, Michelle, looks pretty remarkable. I don't think she, I mean, she's so good that uh, she's been here a couple of years, unlikely that she's going to be easy to 
uh, recruit. But if I can get her on the phone, would you at least agree to talk to her on an exploratory basis? So I always get the hiring manager to engage with me in this passive candidate conversational approach to recruiting. That to me is essential. This is a high touch approach is we just identified literally in an hour or two, we could find 15 or 20 people on seek out that are remarkable people. Now the challenge is, can I talk with them and can I recruit them and close them and hire them? And so there's, um, we're just at the top of the funnel, but I, I can't do it alone. I, as a recruiter, I don't make the decision. All I do is uh, act as a go-between between the hiring manager and the candidate. Uh, but in this case, so we have a number of different email approaches. Our emails tend to be stories, not job descriptions. Uh, and I think in this case, I use what I'll call the advisory approach is I took the time pressure off. I said, okay, let me just see. Okay, I'm gonna send it to these people. Uh, I'm gonna take the time pressure off. I have to be attention getting. Uh, I knew that in a national accounts approach, the challenger sales model is what we're trying to implement at my security company because I talked with the hiring manager about it. Uh, they wanna implement that company-wide. Uh, so I said, hi, we're, we're a hot company. Let me kind of get a person uh, engaged in a conversation. And that's the only purpose here. If the can and I'm gonna send out uh, using uh, some campaign approach, using Seekout, which has one and Ed will go through that. And it probably, and I probably of the 20 people, I'm probably gonna get three or four the first time. My goal is I've got to get 20. I don't, uh, or I got to get at least 50%. So the goal is I'm not gonna get more candidates. I'm gonna get those candidates to respond. So it's fundamentally a different approach for recruiting. I already got my candidates. Why do I need, I, Michelle's a great person. I got to talk with her. Even if she's not gonna uh, take my offer, I've got to connect with her and network with her because not only is she good, she's also has 30 or 40 or 50 other people who are good. So when I get a person on the phone, a semi-finalist, is someone who's either gonna get the job or can give me someone who's gonna get the job. So a lot of these things that I'm doing are what I call weak connections. Once I get someone in the conversation, I'm going full bore. I do not give up until the candidate says, that, that's not a great job. But so I pers so persistence is part of it. Uh, so this email is one of a number of different types of emails we have. This is what I call the advisory approach. Uh, will it work? Actually, I'm not positive this one work because I just kind of wrote it for here, but we've got about 30 or 40 templates, which are in the book. If you get the book, you'll see there's a bunch of templates on different approaches and different campaigns. But in this case, my goal is to engage in a conversation around the concept of, hey, let's have a conversation, help us define the job. So that's kind of the idea here. Um, Ed, any thoughts on this one? I, I was actually gonna send it out, but I think what we said, oh, I know what we said we're gonna do. Uh, we are going to actually send this out to a boot group of people. If you call the folks at Seek Out for a demo, we're going to give you the results of this, probably plus two or three other ideas on how to write great email. So just getting the demo from email, you get a copy of the book. But the idea is, hey, you got to write stories. <laughs> we tell a lot of stories. We don't write job descriptions. We tell stories. So let me leave it there, Ed, and you can kind of take it for over. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, you, you know, I think... I think writing an engaging email is is difficult. Um, I think it's easy to fall in the trap of talking about what you need. You know, I, I, I need these skills. I need somebody to come and solve this problem for me. I need to hire an engineer. Um, but the truth is that nobody that you're talking to actually cares about any of those things. They care about what they need. Um, and being able to turn this conversation around and talk about those sorts of things and actually actually have a conversation, especially with senior candidates. I mean, this is a two-way street that you, wanna, you want the opportunity to feel it out and, and make sure the time investment is actually worth it. That's, that's pretty critical. Um, I really like this approach. I, I do very much the same thing when I'm recruiting as well. Um, and, and I think the templates and the tips are available in Lou's book are, are fantastic for getting started down this path but the persistence part i think is particularly important and i think i think the persistence part is is in many cases almost as hard to do as as writing some great content um you know if you're used to doing something like using linkedin recruiter you don't have any automation available to you you can really only send a single in mail it's very hard to be persistent through that channel um, we recommend that an omni-channel approach is really the way to go and um you know we have a, a lot of automation a lot of tooling around that which i'm, I'm going to very briefly show you and um you know something that if you if you use linkedin a lot um the average response rates to email messages are, are somewhere in the 20 or 30 percent range depending on 
what you're recruiting for if you can if you can write some engaging content. Um, on the seek out side, when we use omni-channel campaigns, we might do a three, four, five, six step automated outreach program um, that can combine in-mails and emails and phone calls and text messages and manual steps in, into a, a true plan for how you are going to be persistent and how you are going to get a hold of this person. And our research shows that most replies happen after the third, fourth, or fifth content attempt. Um, and our best customers, the ones who have great roles and great content and are using these tools in the best possible ways, they're getting in excess of 80% response rates. They can't keep up with the demand that they're getting for conversations. They only need to source a very small number of semi-finalists because they know that the vast majority of them are going to have that conversation with them. Um, so the, the time saving, the efficiency gains, just the better people that you get in the recruiting process process, um, it is a, a phenomenal change compared to that, that sort of prey and spray methodology, which, which can be a little bit common sometimes. Um, so switching ourselves back to the actual tool, assuming I'm going to share the right screen. Um, here we are, we've, we've got those, those seven shortlisted candidates that we were talking about earlier, um, our national account managers in the US who hit those achiever terms, um, who are in that security and cybersecurity space, who have that SaaS enterprise account management experience, and who work for top security companies. Um, we're able to take all of these people um, from our search results, and, and with just a single click, um, we're able to add them to a project. Um, and projects are great because they allow us to keep ourselves organized, um, and they allow us to share with others. Um, so potentially, if we were partnering with somebody at this point, maybe the hiring manager wanted to be involved, we can actually share this project. We get a little magic link. They don't need to seek out account. They can come through, and they can look at the people that we've been sourcing. They can leave comments. They can do other bits and pieces as part of that as well. Um, but then you have these two magic buttons, these get email and these get phone button. So we are pulling in personal work and educational email addresses for these people. And we are pulling in cell phone and landline numbers whenever they're available. And we're making that available to you to use as a one-off. I can, I can just pick up this email address and I can send a one-off email very quickly. Um, but I can also take this and export it into my ATS or CRM or use the automated messaging capability that's available in Seekout. Um, so I've taken Lou's template, and I've built that out into an automated email here. And um, in this example, it's very simple. We're only mail merging one field, which is the first name, but we have lots of options if you want to be customizing this in real time. And all of our candidates are here, um, and they are available for us to actually run this campaign. And it was as simple as just clicking a button. I can click on Start Campaign. Those seven emails are going to go out. They would come directly from me but I also have the option of setting up a hiring manager or an executive in my organization. I can have the emails come directly from them, which can actually help a lot if you're doing something pretty critical or an executive role. But the real power comes from the fact that I don't have to stop there and I can add more steps. I can add email steps. I can add phone call steps. I can add text message steps. Um, I can add LinkedIn or connection request steps as well. Um, and these are smart automations. Um, so I can choose when the second email goes out, how many days after that first message. I can choose if I'm sending it as a reply to the first message or if I'm sending it as a brand new email. And I can type my subject and I can have my body and I can have my mail merge fields in there and it's all ready to go. I can have as many of these steps as I want um, and the system is smart enough to stop the campaign on reply. So as you're running through these things, if somebody replies to one of your emails, it goes directly to your in box. Um, whether it be Gmail or Outlook or anything like that, the campaign stops. So you're not sending them more messages after you've gotten that reply. And then you can engage directly via email and go through uh, you know, whatever your recruiting and interview process is going to be to get those people into the pipeline. Um, super powerful, um, lots of pre-built templates to get you started. Um, very easy to take things like the templates in Lou's book and get them into this process. Allows you to do so much more as a recruiter because you could have several of these running at any point in time time, they're all off doing their own thing. You can go off and source on your next role and you only really have to worry about the replies as they come through. So massive time saving and many of our customers find that they can be enormously more efficient when they're doing this kind of outreach automation. Hopping back into our actual presentation at this point, um, 
I think I think Ludus is probably a, a good segue uh, to talking about uh, about your concept of a recruiter's sure. driver's yeah. license. Okay, build this up as I talk through it, Ed. So okay. as opposed to showing the whole thing. So part of it is once you get people on the phone, and this is the high touch component. Remember, I'm selling the drive or the conversation, not uh, the job. So I've asked the candidate, would you be open to explore a situation if it were clearly superior to what you're doing today? I put good people on the bus. Those are my semifinalists. And in that image I showed you, that's the start of the drive. These are semifinalists. Uh, put the first bullet point up, Ed. I want to just make sure. It, there's a sequence and logic here. I've called the person up. In one case, this woman, Michelle, is the Oracle woman. She's just a remarkable person. She's a clear top person. She knows she's a top person. My job is just to get her on the bus to begin with. And then I've got to kind of demonstrate to her that this job actually is a career move. First, I just want to have a conversation with her. Uh, and then I want to get her so excited. That takes about 10 minutes to pull that off. But here's the first two things that happen. You have to be able to overcome. One second, Ed. Uh, uh, that's OK. We can put that one there. Okay. Uh, we do need to have a few. Uh, I want to go through a few objections. I call someone up. Would you be open to explore a situation if we're clearly superior to what you're doing today? The candidate says, yeah, but what's the compensation? Which is very, very typical. Even though they engage with you, they always say, what's the compensation? Here's how you respond to that first one. So I called up, I see Karen's name here. So let me just kind of call Karen up. Uh, hey, Karen, if you open to explore a situation clearly superior to what you're doing today. Said, well, I'm not looking, but what's the money? I said, Karen, it doesn't really matter what the compensation is if it's not a career move. Let's first see if it's a career move. Oh, okay. And then, and that sometimes gets people into the conversation. Uh, let me kind of go through one more. Let's put the, the rest of the slide up there, Ed, and then I'll kind of walk through this whole thing of this high touch approach. Uh, and even put the chart up here. Uh, my job in the recruiting process is to demonstrate in the first phone call that if we decide to move forward, it is not because of the money, it's because of the career opportunity. So I call Karen up. Karen, we open up explore situations, close period. She says, yeah, but what's the money? In fact, once a person says, what's the money? They're already in the game. Uh, they've already decided they're going to, going to pursue it. Uh, so that's a real clue that the candidate's interested in what you have to offer. Sometimes they don't say that, but if you get that. But then you've got to say, it doesn't really matter what we pay you. Let's first see if it's a career move. And in all our training and in the book, these scripts are all there. You have to have this scripted out. Uh, then they said, what's a career move? And here's where I set the stage. I said, Karen, uh, in my mind, a career move has got to give you at least a 30% increase, at least. But it's none of it's money. It's not money. It's got to be a bigger job, which is could be 5 or 10% of that 30%. Could be a job with more impact. Could be another 5 or 10%. Clearly a mix of more satisfying work. Uh, and that could be another 5 or 10%. But I've got to continue that over a couple of period, a couple of years. So collectively, that would be get me at least a 30% increase on an annual kind of a basis, non-monetary. The idea being that if I can achieve that, your compensation will grow rapidly over periods of time because you're taking on bigger roles and more uh, responsibility. Obviously, that's going to take some time to pull that off. So let me just do this to even see if we have an opportunity here. Let me just review your LinkedIn profile very, very quickly. Uh, five or 10 minutes. I'll then, uh, if this job represents a career move, I'll then describe why I believe it makes sense to get serious. And if it does, we can get we can continue it. If not, we can at least network for future opportunities. So this is where I then, at this point in time, I've told the candidate what I'm going to do. I basically have got 10 or 15 minutes of permission marketing to ask this candidate questions about her background or his or her background. So in this case, I'm talking with Karen. Uh, it's five or 10 minutes. They say, Karen, you know, I think we actually have something here. This is at the 10 or 12 minute mark. Here's what I think. I think the job is clearly going to be bigger. Uh, could be, I think you said you're managing five people. This is going to be seven people. Uh, it looks like the, the impact of this job is very critical because the focus of what you want to do uh, is clear. You're going to be doing more architect of systems background. So it could be interesting. The one area I have a bit of concern, though, is the rate of growth we're having here. Uh, and the depth of responsibility could be a little bit bigger. So this could actually be a 30 to 40% increase. But I do like your background. Uh, 
you know, is this something you'd be interested in pursuing? It could be a bit of a stretch, but I'd still like to arrange a meeting with the hiring manager if I could. What typically happens is when I ask a candidate or I push the candidate away, say this could be too big a job. Now you gotta remember, Karen didn't, wasn't even looking for a job earlier this morning. Two hours later, she's saying, oh, this could be a good career move for her. Now what's gonna happen is the Karens of the world are gonna kind of get excited about that. Ooh, this could be a good move. And they're gonna start pondering this could be a good move. What typically happens though, too many recruiters start selling the candidate when the candidate, I'm interested. That's not recruiting. Candidate, you selling the candidate is not good recruiting, particularly when you're dealing with top performers. You got to get the candidate excited about the job. They got to sell you. So this con the bus ride that I'm going on allows for a mutual conversation, discussion back and forth. It allows me to do my due diligence and find what I call the career gap. And I say, hey, Karen, this job could be a real big job, could really put you on a different career path. Would you be open to pursue it? This is important because candidates don't make the decision alone. They'll go home and talk to their friends, family, spouse, kids, grandparents, children, it doesn't matter. They'll have this conversation. And you got to recognize we have two buyers here, buyer hiring manager, buyer the candidate. And if the candidate is not intrinsically motivated to pursue your job for something other than the compensation, the likelihood of a win-win hiring outcome is remote. I call that whole process controlling the conversation. Too many candidates opt out before they know the job. Too many recruiters oversell the job before the candidate understands the job and they come across as desperate. You're balancing two conversations, one with a great hiring manager who's discriminating, who's got a narrow focus. You also got a candidate who's thinking short-term. No, the purpose of this first 10 to 15 minute call is to think long-term. Just as important if the candidate's too high or too low, you can network with the person and get other referrals. We won't get into that. It's in the book and how you get a proactive referrals. But once I get 15 or 20 people, probably of that first 15 or 20, uh, five or six are going to be potential real finalists I'll present to the hiring manager. But I'm going to get another half a dozen great referrals who are also going to be great. So now when I call up someone whom I don't know, I said, hey, I just talked to Karen Green. Uh, she suggested I give you a call. Now, all of a sudden, I've taken a cold call into a warm call. That's the idea of driving the bus. And that's why it's so important. And LinkedIn, excuse me, Seek Out does all of that heavy lifting. That's why I just love it. You got to put this high touch capability on it, but Seek Out gets you in the game within hours. You then got to apply your recruiting skills on top of that, and you're off to the races. I couldn't have said it better myself, Lou. And interestingly enough, there's there's a great conversation happening in the chat at the moment. I don't know if you <laughs> saw it, but somebody's asking, do people really take bigger jobs for less salary? Is that actually a thing? Um, my personal experience is absolutely yes. I've, I've very successfully recruited people doing that. And I've done that several times personally myself, um, taking a, a bigger role, a better role, a role with a higher ceiling, a role more aligned with the culture and values that I'm looking for or technologies that I'm interested in, even though they involve the pay cut. Um, what would you say uh, about that, Lou? I'm, I'm well, let me say this. So let me, let me well. take Jared here. So let's assume I recruited Jared and it's now the conversation. I said, Jared, you're probably going to be a, a finalist for this job. Three, three or four weeks, you're going to get an offer. Uh, but I, before you get that offer, I'm going to ask you this question. I'm going to say, Jared, forget the money. Do you want this job? Because if you don't want this job, forget it. It doesn't matter what we pay you. You will be unhappy. You will underperform. You will be dissatisfied. You will leave within a year. So I'm going to ask you three weeks or three a day or two before you get the official offer, do you really want this job? Tell me why. And I expect you to be able to define this 30% in your own words. Because if you can't define that 30% in your own words, you're going to make a career mistake. So let me kind of, and I do this 100% of the time. I've done it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of searches. And that is a difference maker. Now, quite frankly, if the compensation is more than 10 to 15% off, eh, that's, that's getting to be a bit of a stretch. Uh, but I can get a little bit. I can demonstrate that uh, my job a year from now or two years from now is going to put that person on a faster career path that will blow the compensation away from the day one compensation. The idea is I cannot let people make decisions based on what they got on the start date. They got to make decisions what they're going to do and what they're going to become over the first year or two years. That is the difference maker. Candidates might not give you a big hug, but they'll realize 
uh, making a short-term decision or a long-term decision using short-term uh, information is a career death knell. Uh, so I think really that's the key. And I think all of a sudden candidates uh, realize that the recruiter is more a career counselor than just somebody who's transactionally trying to put someone in the seats. Very, very good points. Thank you, Lou. Um, Lou briefly mentioned the, the topic of, of getting referrals, um, and he does go into a lot of I don't think we have enough time for this, and I kind of skipped this. So, so we, will, we could go straight past this, but do, do forget, don't forget to check out that particular section. We also have some really great functionality for that in Seek Out um, that takes the referral program and puts it back into the hands of the recruiter, um, not relying on people to tell you who they know that might be a good fit, but letting you see who they are connected to and proactively reach out for a reference or a referral to um, so come along and, and do that seek out demo. And we will show you exactly how that works. Yeah, let me kind of summarize this and then uh, show you can demonstrate how people get uh, a copy of the book. The book is higher with your head uh, right there. You can take a screenshot of it. You actually can get them on Amazon. The Kindle version on an iPad is actually phenomenal because it got color pictures and all, et cetera, et cetera. But the re reality, if I kind of just kind of give the big picture summary. The whole focus is hiring for the anniversary date, not the start date. How you define candidates, how you define work, how you demonstrate that your job's a career move. When you do that, you don't need a lot of people. You just need the right people. So a lot of work is, uh, let's, let's use seek out to pre-qualify candidates who are semi-finalists, can do the work, mandatory they do the work, but you gotta define the work as performance objectives, not a list of skills. They've got to be recognized for doing outstanding work. Seek Out allows you to find those two criteria. Seek Out also lets you find people who see that job naturally as a career move. Seek Out also lets you to write great emails and a campaign to get people engaged in that bus ride. But once you get people on the phone, you then have to recognize that this is a conversation. And what I sell is the conversation. I don't sell the job. In my mind, that's what win-win hiring is, hiring for the anniversary date, not the start date. And if you can offer people a true career move, now you got to deliver on the promise, you're going to change the name of the game. And if somebody, I'm doing a talk this afternoon on diversity, and people said, how is this a diverse? I said, I don't, and I, I've actually changed the title of the slide a little bit. I said, uh, diversity hiring by default. Uh, when I first took that first assignment 43 years ago, I just asked the hiring manager, what does this person need to do to be successful? Then I had, and all of a sudden, and it was different than a typical job description. And HR people said, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Well, I talked to the number one labor attorney in the country, David Goldstein at Littler Mendelssohn. And I said, David, can you actually write job descriptions that define success as a series of performance objectives rather than a list of skills? His white paper is in the book, in the appendix of the book. He said, not only can you do it, it's... It's more objective. Objective criteria is anything. If a person can do the work, he or she deserves that job. I don't care if they're old or young, black or white, green or yellow. If they can do the work, they deserve that job. So that's why I say it's really diversity hiring by default when you define work. Once you define work as a series of skills, then you got to kind of interact and overcome the fact that the mistake is defining a job based on skills, experience, and competencies. When you define it based on performance, you're well on your way to hiring great people every time. Thank you for wrapping that up, Lou. That was a great summary. Um, and Lou, we've been excited to have you here today and, and to be working on this together. And, and we're thrilled with this partnership to be able to give out a free copy of Hire With Your Head. Um, we've got both the physical and the digital versions available. So it's going to be your choice. And all you need to do is, is come to seekout.com and come and have a demo of Seekout. Um, join us, learn a little bit more about how it works, um, ask some questions, dig into detail about some of these things around diversity and search, projects, automation, referrals, ATS search that we're able to do that can really make your lives a million times easier. Um, and with no other commitment than that, we are going to get you your very own copy of Hire with okay, your so head. Okay, so you got to answer Karen. She said, can she get a copy of the book if she's already a customer? You better say I, I yes. I think we could probably figure that out. Yes, Karen. Um, have, a, have a chat with me or your customer success manager after the call, and we will definitely get you a copy. In fact, you'll get that instead of a sweatshirt, Karen, so we're okay. 
And that probably goes for anybody else too that feels the same way. Um, of course, if you if you do have any questions about um, Lou's performance-based hiring model and want to talk to Lou directly, his email address is here. Uh, you can also reach out to me um, or find me on LinkedIn and I would be happy to connect. Um, we're going to email you all after the webinar today. That URL is going to be in there, so you don't need to write it down right now. Um, we'll have a copy of the video from today that you can watch or that you can share with your teams. Um, we hope that you found this a, a really informative session. Um, Lou, is there anything else you'd like to say? I think we're right on I the hour. I think we got it. I think it. I think really the reality is, is you don't need to spend, you don't need a lot of candidates. You need the right candidates. You got to spend more time with fewer people. And the, our results have been, uh, if you get an assignment today, you should have candidates in two days. You should be talking with them by next week and out of interviews. You don't need a lot of candidates. You just got to use the right techniques with a few candidates and the close rate uh, will be equally as fast. Uh, your response rate will be higher, but you spend more time with fewer candidates, but the productivity is exactly the same, if not faster, but more important is you're raising the talent bar, and that's really the key. Yep. I thought we might make it through the whole webinar without getting my cat on camera, but at least you managed to leave it to the last couple of seconds. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this was fantastic. I've, I've really enjoyed the discussion, Lou. Um, great having you here. Love this info and this process. I'm a big believer in it. I highly recommend everybody to, to dig into it a little bit deeper if it's not something that you've come across before. Um, and we hope to see you on some Seekout demos or hear from you if there's anything else that we can do to help. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, guys.